So please welcome Sally Paul and Helen Quinn. Thank you um, for having us here today to talk about our approach to um, death and dying and bereavement in school communities. So um, just what we'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the process of how the approach was established because I think that's really important in thinking about the importance of how um, we developed it together and that was key to what came out of, of the work that is going to be highlighted at the end. Um, but to give you the background to this initial project, um, prior to working at the University of Strathclyde, I was a social worker, a palliative care social worker at Strathcar and Hospice, and I was working with children who had experienced the death of someone important. I was aware that sometimes the referrals that we were getting for children weren't always appropriate, and that was because some of the adults who had referred the children hadn't even acknowledged that death with the child. So I was keen to start thinking about how we could um, develop more of a proactive response to supporting children in their own kind of communities. And that sat within this broader context. And as you will all know, um, death is a normal part of the life cycle and bereavement is a universal experience. We will all experience the death of someone important. For children, it's estimated that about 78% of under 16 year olds have experienced the death of a second degree relative um, or, uh, or a friend or a neighbor. Um, in young offenders, that's four times higher. Um, and what is striking about those statistics is that children are still frequently excluded from conversation, education and support about bereavement and about death and dying um, more generally. They are not systematically taught about death as a normal part of the life cycle, and they're not systematically given the tools that they can have to know how to respond to their own grief and that of their, their peers. And in the UK, there's lots of policies, some of which is highlighted there, um, that covers um, youth offending, children more generally, palliative care, um, mental health, and all of these documents highlight the importance of engaging children around bereavement and around death and dying more broadly. So there's a real appetite for doing that. In Scotland, um, the ACEs, can you put your hand up if you're aware of the ACEs? Quite a few people. So these are adverse childhood experiences that are getting lots of attention due to the effect that they can have on a child's health presently and into adulthood. And currently, bereavement isn't classed as one of those adverse childhood experiences, but there is um, an increasing argument and evidence to suggest that it could be. So definitely needs, more needs to be done in this area. So a PhD that was funded by Strathcairn Hospice was um, initiated in Helen School and another school, and um, we're gonna talk about what came about as, as a result of that process. So the first step was to find out what was going on in schools. So Helen is going to tell you about her professional experience as a teacher. I think perhaps the, the, the picture there maybe tells you uh, a lot more than my words could. Um, it's something that you'll be familiar with. I've been a teacher now for 25 years. Um, and when I first went into teaching, uh, I remember my first post and I was all excited and I turned up on the first in-service day before the children, the day before the children came in. And the head teacher sat me down and told me about the class. You know, he's a troublemaker. She struggles with reading. Oh, and there's one wee guy in the class. His dad died during the summer. Don't mention it to him. It, it, it was something to do with drugs. Just don't mention it because you'll upset him. Now, I was a probationer at the time. I was very new to the job. And I thought, that sounds really odd not to mention it to him. But she's a head teacher. She knows what she's talking about. She said to me, um, just, just carry on as normal. That's, that's probably what he needs. So... The next day that class came in and I taught that boy for an entire year, never once mentioned his dad to him. And taking his lead from me, he never once mentioned his dad in the class. And I look back at that now and I knew at the time that it didn't feel right, but I didn't have the confidence to sort of overrule what the, you know, the general consensus was that you might upset him by mentioning his dad. And when I look back now, I'm horrified. I'll, I'll let that child down. You know, something had happened in his life that was huge, and maybe he didn't want to spend all day every day talking about his dad, I'm sure he didn't. But for me to be the main adult in his life outside of just his mum, 
never to mention his dad seems to me not to be right. But I think that's, that's indicative of what things were like in schools at the time. And since then, we, we definitely have, schools have moved on. Um, we are more aware of, of things like the, the adverse childhood experiences. We're more aware of our role in developing the health and well-being of the children and, and, and looking beyond just their academic needs and, you know, looking at the wider child. We definitely have got better at that. But in our school before Sally came in, that was maybe six years ago, we'd had children who um, had lost parents through suicide. We had a child whose mum had died suddenly of an aneurysm when, when he was with her in the house. Um, we had children whose parents were uh, going through terminal um, illnesses. And we were aware of that as a school staff, and we, we did all we could to help them. And we, you know, we tried really hard. We were caring for them. We were in contact with the family and, and trying hard to do the best we could by them. But we were very much aware at the time that what we were doing wasn't really enough. It didn't feel like we were doing enough. And we were very aware that we were making it up as we were going along. What we were doing wasn't based on any expertise or any knowledge. We were just trying to do the right thing for the children. And that's where Sally came in um, to, to do her research. So there was this, really this culture of silence and teachers often talked about um, that research process being a light bulb moment, that they realised that actually they don't do something, but they should. So they were keen to start thinking about what that might look like. The children, they were kind of key to this research because we wanted to make sure that anything that we developed between the school and the hospice reflected the children's needs and the children's voices. Um, and we spoke to children aged 9 to 12. The focus wasn't to ask them if they'd had a bereavement, but in doing that, they, they shared their bereavement stories. 81% of the 32 children that I spoke to said that they'd had a recent bereavement, which is much higher than that, that percentage that I... Well, a little bit higher than the percentage I gave you up to 16, up to 16 year olds. What they said, though, was that death was everywhere. Um, it was in their history lessons, the Glencoe Massacre. It was in the news, and they had lots of examples where it had come up in the news. It was in the adverts that they were watching in relation to things like Comic Relief and Oxfam. It was in the films that they were watching. This is um, The Hunger Games that a few of them were reading and watching, where people are killed through um, being stabbed, arrows, hit by rocks, those kind of things. It was in the books they were reading, and Harry Potter was mentioned again a couple of times, and I've mentioned this before, but there's 158 deaths in Harry Potter, so bereavement is a big feature of that novel, those novels. And it was also in some of the computer games that they were playing. This is Call of Duty, 18 plus, and you can see how people die in, in those video games that they were playing. And despite this omnipresence of death, the children still said that no one really acknowledged it with them. There were a few examples where some parents did and some teachers did, but on the whole, they felt that people really didn't talk to them about death or bereavement. And because of this, they really didn't have the tools that they needed to look after themselves when they were experiencing some of these difficult emotions or look after their peers and their family members, and there seemed to be an appetite to do that. And this was reflected in some of the questions that they asked about death and bereavement. And they had lots of questions about that. Um, and these are some of the questions, if the sound Why goes Why do well. people die? Why can't we live forever? Why is life limited? What happens when you die? What happens to dead people's bodies? What happens to your skin when you die? How long does it take to die? Is it painful? What does it feel like to die? What happens when you are dead? Does your body grow after death? What is it like being dead? Do you still feel or see? Where do your body go when you die? Do you feel anything when you're dead? Why do people bury coffins in the ground? 
How long does it take for someone's grave to be built? What happens to the, the bodies after they have been buried? Why do people get cremated or buried and how? How can you be dead but you can do, donate lungs and stuff? Do we go to heaven? What happens to your soul? Is hell real? Are they in a better place? Where do they go after they perish? Do we come back as an animal? If heaven lasts forever, what do you do? So as you can see, there was a range of questions that the children had. Some of them to do with organ donation, some of them to do with spiritual and religious ideas. Some of them um, just asking for facts about you know, what happens to your body when it's dead? I don't, I don't know about that. So based on those questions and the children's ideas for how those questions could be answered, and also the teachers and the hospice staff ideas for how work could be developed in this area, we came up with these three different activities. The first of which was to develop a death and grief education program, which is called the Resilience Project. The second was to develop a bereavement training for the whole community, uh, whole school community, and that was really important to the children because they recognised that often their teacher was the one stood up at the front of the classroom and didn't have the time to engage with them about these issues, and it might be the classroom assistant or the janitor. And also we developed a bereavement policy, and we're going to talk a bit more about each one of those individually, but I guess what we wanted to highlight was that those three activities are trying to have, um, and this wasn't the goal, but what they do have is this kind of proactive um, response where children should be prepared and have the answers about what death is and how it's a normal part of the life cycle, but also that reactive response. So what do you do if a child turns up in your classroom and says, my mum's just died or my dad is dying, what, what do you do then? So it's about two of those things that, that are going on in these activities. So to begin with, um, some of the staff in the school, a small group of the staff in the school worked together with Sally to do some curricular development, which is, is quite a straightforward thing for us as teachers. It's something that we're used to and we do all the time. So it was the most comfortable um, start for us. Really, what we produced in the Resilience Programme was a programme that was based around helping children to deal with loss and change of any kind and uh, transitions as well. It helped them to identify feelings and gave them strategies to use to help them to cope with particularly difficult feelings. It was useful because it gave the staff a structure. We had four focus weeks in the year and we all know that when we come back in August, we do a week all about transition. When we're here in November, we look at remembrance. Around about spring and Easter time, new life. And then in June, we would have a Go Yellow Day in conjunction with Strathcarran Hospice. And so it gave it a really good, clear structure. It linked well into the curriculum. And it really gave us um, something to get our, uh, to get our teeth into um, across the school and the nursery. So this was starting with children who were age three. The programme ran very well. And when we came to evaluate it, we found that it had developed the children's emotional literacy. They'd developed their language around feelings and uh, around loss and change. It covered a whole lot of things from the Curriculum for Excellence, particularly health and wellbeing strands, but also lots of other things from the curriculum. So in terms of ticking boxes, it did a lot of those things for us, which teachers quite like that. We pretend we don't, but, but we do. Um, it developed the children's resilience and their own mental wellbeing um, in lots of ways. But what it didn't do, we found, was that it didn't really address the children's questions that they'd had about death. It didn't really have the answers to those questions that you've just listened to. And so we felt that we needed to do more about it. But also, when we first started doing our work in, in the school, the, the rest of the staff was, referred to us as the death group. You're the death group. And then when we made this resilience programme, we handed it out to them and they were teaching it. And we realised that it wasn't just about death, it was about so, so much more. But then there was a bit of a danger in that because whilst it was not just about death, 
it should still be about death. And we found that some teachers were getting stuck into it. It was great. It was about loss and change and transition, but don't mention death. You know, it, we, we could talk about changing from primary three to primary four. That's a nice, safe transition to talk about. But death was a bit more difficult. And so we found that for the staff, we really needed to be much more explicit in, in looking at, at death and dying and bereavement in order to meet the needs that, that the children had expressed. What we did then, after, this, um, after we'd seen this uh, evaluation, was to move on then to um, a resilience project. We wrote a resilience project which specifically addressed the questions that the children had. It sits as part of our wider resilience programme, so it's five particular lessons which are taught in primary six and primary seven in our school. The five lessons would be covering health and wellbeing, science, RE, literacy, ICT skills. So again, it was really very cross-curricular. Um, the lessons also included a homework research task, which proved very, very popular. The children all completed it, and that's very unusual for homework. Um, they, would, they had to go home, research what was done in a particular um, culture or religion, what were their faith customs regarding death and dying, and then they would come back and share that with the class. And it was excellent from the point of view of, for the children who wanted to get it close, you know, we had children, we've got children from a whole range of cultural backgrounds, different parents from different countries. So we had people coming back and saying, my granny told me what we did, what they did in India, and my gran was talking about what they do in Poland. But we also had children who could remove it further from themselves because that's what they were more comfortable with. And they were going down the horrible history routes and telling us about brains being pulled down noses. And it really it, it gave scope for all sorts of different ideas about how to look at death and dying. But more importantly for us, it also gave parents an opportunity for a way into that topic. So when the children were going home with this homework task, it gave parents and carers an easy way into the conversation about death and dying, which the feedback we got from parents was that, yes, they wanted to talk to their children about it, but they just didn't quite know how to go there. So starting off from this homework task gave them something to work on together that then they could explore uh, their own family's traditions and ideas and values um, alongside it. It's now the third year of us teaching this resilience project. And what we found is we did it with primary six and with primary seven, and what we've done is we've repeated it. So I was worried that there was going to be the primary six children would go into primary seven and say, we've done these five lessons already. But there's so much scope in the lessons that actually it was different every time anyway. The children bring different questions to it because when they first are looking at it, they, it's their initial reactions. When they come back to that learning a year later, there's so much more they want to know. There's so much more that they're interested in. The lessons are quite scripted from the point of view of the teacher in terms of giving them questions to ask or uh, some information to give to the class. And that really helped the staff to develop their own comfort levels because teachers are fine at sitting down with a class and having a chat about a whole lot of different things. But when it came to talking about death and dying and bereavement, we were, we were not very sure. And so to scaffold to support staff who were finding that difficult, the, the scripted nature of these lessons really, really helped to get them started. And then once I said, once the discussion started, the, the, the teachers then, we go into natural teacher mode and we just can have those discussions on the basis of what the children bring to the lesson. Um, it fitted into our existing curriculum very well and worked well in terms of being, being exactly what the children were looking for at that level. And so really responding to the children's questions and giving them more idea of that it was okay to talk about this and that it wasn't a, a weird and wonderful thing that we were doing. The children responded to it particularly well, much more easily than the staff did. What do you think we'll come into there? <clears throat> Is that we've, we've evaluated the project and um, the children in the focus group had said that they were having a, a debate in the playground about whether or not they should donate the organs and everyone except one boy agreed. Can you believe that? I mean, why wouldn't you want to donate your own organs? And he's like, that's just gross. No one's having my heart. But it was really alive in the playground and, and it was some learning that they were, they were taking forward. Um, so the next activity that we developed was the bereavement training. 
And this was done with um, the school staff um, and in, in response to their needs, but also using the expertise of the hospice staff who had delivered training like this before. And that has now been rolled out to, to all schools um, in the hospice catchment area, Strathcarran Hospice, and is currently led by Elaine McManus, who, if she weighs, is somewhere in the back. She's right over there, and I'm sure she will talk to you more about this. Um, like I said before, it's aimed at all school staff, um, and it's delivered over two and a half hours to really reflect at the time that the, the schools have for this kind of education. Um, they really didn't think that with all the other competing demands they had, that they could send whole school groups to, to anything more than this. And what it aims is to develop the confidence of staff to engage and support children um, when they're experiencing bereavement. It's not about developing their skills. The school staff had the skills to work with children and young people. They've been doing it for years. They've been taught how to engage them. But they didn't always have the confidence to kind of talk about this issue. And so it was really focusing on building that confidence and giving them some tools to start those conversations. And it was also about promoting a culture in the school where these kind of conversations were okay, they weren't going to be shut down um, and ignored, there, were, there was this open space for it. Um, the training reinforced um, the other aspects about the death education program, but also about the importance of having a bereavement policy in place. Um, and it's also been evaluated, which showed a really upward trend in the confidence of the staff to engage with children around bereavement we need to see if that will be continued. We don't have that information yet, but we hope that it will. Um, and then the last activity was this bereavement policy. And what that really aimed to do was to provide a framework for how to support pupils um, either prior to a bereavement, during, or even some time after it. Um, because we know that how schools manage bereavement is important, especially if the event is sudden and there has been no planning or, you know, it's just unexpected, and that that can have an impact on how the child copes and how they feel like they belong in that, in that school community. So the bereavement policy um, provides that framework. It gives ideas to what could be done. Um, it recommends that you work with the family and the school. It signposts key staff and also signposts external services if, if it's felt that they're needed. And again, it reinforces the importance of training for all school staff so that all school staff could have um, these conversations if needed. Quite often the children said that if anyone did speak to them, it was the head teacher, but that wasn't the person that they had the relationship with. They needed it to be from their classroom teacher or the support for learning staff. Um, and again, that's gone out to all schools um, in Falkirk Council. So really um, trying to pull together a lot of the ideas from what you've heard today. If we're wanting to be a compassionate school, then it's not just about the curriculum development. The curriculum development was vital. It was, it was in lots of ways, it was setting the scene. It was giving the children and the staff the, the confidence and the language and the tools to, to be aware of the need for a compassionate, supportive um, environment surrounding death and dying. But it was only a little part of it. We had to have a whole school approach where we were getting it right for everyone, where everybody was involved, as Sally said, it's not just down to the teacher, it's not just down to the children, but the idea that the children can support each other, the children can support us as staff, we can all support each other. There was a lot of partnership work, work that went on. We are linked to um, our local parish. We have links with health um, professionals in, in the surrounding area. We were working with Strathcarran Hospice. And that was really, really vital in, in making it work right in our school for us. Staff health and well-being was also very important because we have staff who uh, will suffer bereavement or will have issues or difficulties of their own. And it was really important for us to recognise that staff would need support in order to, to go through this process and that that would be an ongoing thing in our school. The management and leadership Without the correct management, it wouldn't have been possible for us to, to transform our school. And I really do believe that our school has been transformed. St Francis Saviour's is, is a, a good school. I love the school that I work in. It's a great school to be in. But we have transformed it in terms of 
how we, how we look at death and dying and bereavement. And a lot of that has come from management, because without the head teacher who we had at the time when Sally first approached us, there's no way that all of the staff would have been on board. Some people had to be literally, you know, dragged along to the hospice for the training, but we were all there and we all have moved on from it. And now there's not that same issue at all amongst the staff, but it's because the management have constantly looked for examples of this being used in the class. They've looked for ways to encourage staff to, to continue their training. And so that's been really important in keeping it ongoing and not being just, that's a thing we did a few years ago, but now we've moved on to something else. The ethos and the climate in our school has changed. Like death and, and dying has been normalised, I think, in conversation in our school. Um, every November, when, when we have uh, our focus on remembrance, in our school, we make a wall of remembrance and the children are all given a small paper cross that they can take home and they can write the name of somebody who's died and they can decorate it and they can add it to our display. And so in the corridor, the, the display takes up quite a chunk of the corridor. And children, young children were overheard, primary twos, I think, they were kind of just, they were able to read, but only just. And they're still at that sk stage of skipping along the corridor hand in hand. So they're skipping along and they stop to look at the remembrance display and they're reading things like Papa Joe, R-I-P, my rabbit died, and all these things that were on. And then another one, um, my baby brother who died before he was born. So one child turns to the other child, how can you die before you get born? And they're like, I don't know, but that's a shame, isn't it? And then they take hands and skip along the rest of the corridor. And that's, that's more than, adults wouldn't have that much of a conversation with each other about it. It's just something that happens now in our school. They look forward to every year, they go back and they look at the display, Different children bring different things, and it, it just is part of what we do. Or a teacher um, gave me an example recently where she said she had been absent from school after um, the death of her mum. And when she came back into school, she said, I was walking along the corridor, and a wee boy in primary six went by her. She said, I've never taught him, but he stopped. And he was like, I'm really, really sorry to hear about your mum, because that's sad, but it's brilliant that you're back. And she said... That's better than my adult friends have managed, you know? Not in the school staff, obviously we'd manage that because we're a compassionate, but there is, there is a difference in our school and it's evidenced in these kind of, these snippets that we see going on that, that death is now something that people are expected to acknowledge and they're expected to talk about and that it's okay to talk about and it's okay to have questions about. And the difference I can see as well in my own children, my youngest son still goes to our school and his older brothers, when I was preparing for this conference, they're like, what are you all about with all that death stuff? Listen to those questions. And they're kind of rolling their eyes in teenage style. And Andrew, the youngest one, was just like, it's not like that, though. When we have those lessons, it's not, it's not like that. And I just thought, from a nine-year-old, he gets it. But his teenage brothers who, who didn't, involve, you know, didn't have that in their primary school experience, they don't yet get it. But it's possible to change... Um, how people view these things. And Helen mentioned there some of the challenges to this approach. Um, and these are some of them. We don't have time to go through them all in great depth. But teacher concerns, they were a concern. But one that in this school has been overcome because it has had this whole school approach. And everyone's been on board. And that culture where you can share those concerns happens and you get support with that. Parent carer concerns, when I speak to people about this work, that's obviously the first thing that they say, oh, parents wouldn't like that. But in this project, that was not an issue at all. We invited parents along. Um, we invited, I think, 80 parents along. Um, four of them turned up and said, yes, we're happy for you to do this work, um, as long as you tell us about it. Um, and actually, could you tell me about how to talk to my child about it? So they wanted some education too. Um, one of the other challenges is that in initial teacher training, they don't have any education about this, um, how to talk to children about bereavement, and I think that's a real gap. Um, even with that training in Helen's school, the, the staff turnaround is quite high, and I think over the years that I've been involved, it is now a new staff team, so there's a continual need for that training to, to be ongoing and to notice where people haven't had that training and, and to kind of keep going with that. I think also what's a really big challenge, certainly in Scotland, and I'm not familiar with other curriculums, but although it says on the curriculum that children should learn the skills to manage loss and change, 
It nowhere says death. So even the life cycle doesn't mention death. And that can sometimes mean that it's an easy thing for, for teachers to skip because they don't have to tick it off. And it's a bit awkward, so I'll just miss it out. Um, but there are some strengths to this approach, and we'll quickly yeah. go over those. And I think, sorry. I'm sorry, Sally, I, I stole your thunder, so that bell's <laughs> going to ring any second. But basically, <laughs> I, I believe the importance of it, most of all, is the universal access. Every single child, I think, should be taught about death and dying. It, it shouldn't be like an optional extra. And our approach makes sure that every child does in our school. And so the question is then, how do we move that on further and share that with other communities? The three activities of the policy and the curricular development, as well as the staff training, they complement each other and that's what brings about the change. We've already talked about the, the change in the staff in terms of confidence. But also, we're aware that there are already programmes out there, and in our school we use, for example, seasons of growth, just as and when it's, it's necessary, and that fits in very nicely um, with this same programme. And we've found as well that it, it doesn't just make a difference in our school, it's making a difference beyond that. So people in the community are talking about it. Parents are talking to us about it at Parents' Night. People, primary one parents come in, they've never, never been in the school before, they come in and go, oh, we know that you do stuff about death, so what's that all about then? And so it's obviously something that parents are talking about outside of the school and something that can be heard out in the local community, that they're aware that, that we're involving that, uh, ourselves in this discussion. And I think that helps our community then to become more compassionate as well. So just to conclude, to reiterate what we first said, you know, that all children will experience bereavement and preparation and support for that are equally important. We don't just want to be the disaster masters, as kind of Alan was referring to, where you go in after it's happened and fix it. We want to assure that children and adults are, are prepared for events that are, will happen in their life and are a normal part of life. And that's where the preparation and the education comes in. It's also for us very much about upholding children's rights. Children have rights to information about important parts of their life, and this is part of that. They have a right to that if they want, want that information. And it's also about communities caring for their own members. It was so much more appropriate that the children in the first instant spoke to the people that they already knew rather than be referred to me um, where the bereavement was almost medicalised as something that only a specialist can deal with. Because some bereavements do need specialist help, but the most of them don't. And so it was important that communities are equipped to be able to care for their members. But there was also a really important role for the hospice in initi initiating that work. And that was about looking for the strengths of the work that we do, but also noticing what we don't do and noticing the limitations of our work. And that really involves um, being on the ground with the communities, listening to what they say, what they feel that they want, working in partnership, and really seeing death as a social experience and not just a medical one. Okay, and I think that's us. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I did put that slide in because I always forget to tell you. But um, yesterday, actually, Good Life, Good Death very kindly agreed to host the Resilience Project. So if you are interested in it and want to learn more, you can find it um, on their website and download it there. So thank, thank you. you.